ideas are completely removed and nothing is given to replace it. Truly thought requires language. How can you, without language, think or conceptualize? What happens to a language that is withheld or only used in a particular way with its users? Does it become disassociating? One level business, one level orders, commands, and use of brutality, one level education to a specific purpose and level. What of celebration? What of love? What of trust between individuals? There can be no conclusion to the issues raised in this ethic since language is always in continual changing, a fluid phenomenon. One version of this paper was published many years ago in the journal Fire Week, 1983, and at that time I called this section postscript and wrote that it was, quote, not a conclusion because the issues raised here are still very much undecided. The questions I raised then were, how does one begin to destroy a language? How does one replace the image behind the word? I replied that those questions remained unanswered and would probably remain so for a long time. And I'm now struck at how patient I was in that original article about many of the issues I have to deal with in my writing subsequent to the writing of the paper. The absence of writing could be seen as something of a blueprint to my poetic and writing life. Have I answered those questions, or do they still remain unanswered? I believe I have come closer to answering them than I did six years ago. The manuscript she tried to talk has taken me a long way towards the goal of decentering the language. This is not the same thing as destroying the language, which is a far harder thing to do. Also, destruction connotes great storm and drag when, in fact, what words just as well at times is a more subtle but equally profound approach. For instance, in the poem, Discourse on the Logic of Language, the issue that I raised in the earlier postscript, that of father talk and vis-a-vis a mother talk, some sort of balance is achieved despite the anguish of English and despite the fact that English is both a mother tongue and a father tongue. In the accompanying journal I kept as I worked on she tried to tell, I write as follows. I am laying claim to two heritages, one very accessible, the other hidden. The apparent accessibility of European culture is dangerous and misleading, especially what has been allowed to surface and become the rigor of to get anything of value out of it, one has to mine very, very deeply, and only after that does one begin to see the connections and linkages within other cultures. The other wisdom, African wisdom, leaves hunches, gut feelings, and a lot of flying by the of the past free fall only to be caught at the last minute. It calls for a lot more hunting out of the past before one can even get to the essence, because in almost exact reversal of European culture, not much has been allowed to surface. I'm almost tempted to say, that one, has, one can, for that reason, trust that information more. I'm almost tempted to say that one can, for that reason, trust that information more. I must add now that the lack of information bears directly on one's ability to make images. The linguistic rate of subsequent forced marriage between African and English tongues has resulted in a language capable of great rhythms and musicality, one that is and is not English, and one which is among the most vital in the English speaking world today. The continuing challenge for me as a writer poet is to find some deep patterning, a deep structure, as Chomsky puts it in my language, the Caribbean dramatic. The challenge is to find the literary form of dramatic language. As James Baldwin has written, quote, Negro speech is not a question of dropping S's or M's or G's, but a question of the deep. At present, the greatest strength of the Caribbean dramatic lies in its oratorical, oratorical energies, which do not necessarily translate to Easily. Just as the language that English people write is not necessarily or often that which is spoken by them, so too what is spoken in the streets of Trinidad or by some Caribbean people in Toronto is not always going to be the best way of expressing it on the page. To keep in deep structure, the movement, the kinetic energy, the tone and pitch, the slides and glissandos of the demonic within a tradition that is primarily paid down, that is a challenge. In the former postscript, I wrote that it was perhaps ironic that a critique of the use and role of English in a particularly brutal historical context should be written in standard English, but that in itself throws into sharp relief the dilemma described above. I was not completely satisfied with my argument then that the dilemma as to what language is appropriate was answered by my argument that the English language in its complete language belonged to us, and whatever mode that suited our needs should be used. In fact, the problem was that the piece itself did not, as I now believe it ought to, reflect that range that I spoke of. 
Unlike the former piece, the opening paragraphs of this present piece explain the aspects of writing in my early life, are written close to the Caribbean demonic and standard English. Could or ought I have to continue the entire piece in the style? Perhaps, but I do believe that the present piece is a far truer reflection of how I function linguistically than the original one. While I continue to write my father tongue, I continue the quest I identified in 1983 to discover my mother tongue, trying to engender by some alchemical practice a metamorphosis within the language which from the father tongue to the mother tongue. Will I recognize this tongue when I find it? Or is it rather a matter of developing it rather than finding it? Whatever metaphorical images one uses, discovery or development, the issue of recognition is an important one, since it implies that in the word itself is the meaning the image of knowing again. There was a profound eruption of the body into the text of She Tried to Talk, which represents a significant development for me as a poet. The manuscript has become a blaze among the poetic past. In the new world, the female aspect of the body became a site of exploitation and profoundly anti-human demand, forced reproduction along with subsequent forceful abduction of the of children. Furthermore, furthermore, while the possibility of rape remains amorphous, as it is, the female body continues to be severely circumscribed in its interaction with the physical surrounding space and place. How then does this affect the making of poetry, the making of words, the making of images of poetry as I have it to believe, begins in the body and ends in the body? She tries to talk as the first blaze along the path to understanding and resolving this particular conundrum. I continue as I did in the former postscript to see the issue as being one of power and so control. I still, as I did then, fear being reductionist. But writing does entail control in many areas. Control of the word, control of the image, control of information which helps in the process of image making and equally important, control in the production of the final product. By the time the manuscript she tries to tell comes into print, it will be almost two years and many, many rejections after its completion, despite its winning the Casa de la America Prize in nineteen eighty eight. As a female and a black living in a colonial society in Trinidad and Tobago, control is absent in each of these areas, and the absence of writing, especially creative writing, and hence the lack of recognition of writing as a possible vocational profession. As a female and a black presently living in a society that is, in many respects, still colonial, I refer here to Canada's relationship with the United States of America, and a society which is politely but vehemently racist while I may have gained some control of my word and its image making capacity, control of information and production is still problematic. For the many like me, black and female, it is imperative that our writing begin to recreate our histories and our myths, as well as integrate the most painful of experiences, loss of our history and our work, the reacquisition of power to create one's own image and to create one's own image is just is vital to this process. It reaffirms for us that which we have always known, even in those most dark of times which are still with us, when everything conspired to prove otherwise, that we belong most certainly to the race of 